Welcome to Cross and Crown Radio and the Gospel Truth Podcast. I'm Mike Robinson, your host. We're going to be discussing mathematics and God, including William Lane Craig's recent view on mathematics and God. And then I'm going to discuss my particular view of mathematical realism and how mathematics requires God and that God is the ontological ground. He's the foundation for mathematics. Defining mathematics in some ways can be a bit challenging. I'm using the following definition. Mathematics is the abstract science and rational study of number, quantity, and space. The group of sciences that study numbers and shapes. The most well-known example of mathematics is arithmetic, which is the abstract science and the study of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Mathematics appears to describe the realm of entities with attributes that transcend our physical world because numbers are immutable and the series of natural numbers is infinite, yet there is nothing material in the physical universe that is infinite and immutable. So two and two equal four and three and three equal six are immutable truths. These are immutable and immaterial universal truths because they rest upon the being and the nature of God and his attributes. Poitras notes this, in the process of reasoning, we have used our ability to have miniature transcendence, to see a whole. We are imitating the mind of God when we do such. We are finite, but with this kind of projection forward, we depend on his infinity, end of quote. Such mathematical truths never change, they are immutable, and they seem to never begin being true or cease being true. They are non-physical and hold unceasingly and forever. In the abstract, lines and circles and planes are perfect, but these objects that we manufacture in the physical world are never perfect. Mathematical objects are abstract and immaterial as they are known a priori by reason rather than merely empirical. Mathematical truths are essential tools utilized in science, and they apply to the natural world in numerous ways. Excuse the pun. The mathematical realm can be known by humans created in the image of God because it's a reflection and revelation of the divine mind. Immaterial mathematical truths ontically have attributes such as infinity, changelessness, perfection, and necessity, because they are in the mind of God, who is infinite, changeless, perfect, and necessary. Yet the physical cosmos is not infinite, changeless, perfect, and necessary. So the physical cosmos lacks the ontic capacity to account for mathematics. Some thinkers deny that mathematical truths are real, but these anti-realists cannot account for the application of mathematical theories within our world. If they aren't real and are not actually true, why do mathematical theories apply in many features of the cosmos? Putnam opined, non-realism in mathematics makes theoretical achievements appear as miracles. His words, not mine, end of quote. Because God is a being of reason, he has caused the world to function in a manner that reflects rational mathematical truths. God does not capriciously decree decree that one plus one is two, this truth is within the mind of God and is set and fixed and true. Mathematical truths are not arbitrary, and that's one reason the world has the mathematical features that it has. There is no caprice in the realms of creation and humanity. Mathematical truths reflect the attributes and the character of God. Laws of arithmetic are omnipresent, They are true everywhere, just as God is omnipresent. They are infinite and eternal, just as God is. Like God, they are immutable, changeless. In a non-causal manner, they have sway over creation, and it appears that everything in the cosmos must obey mathematical law. God accounts for immutable, necessary mathematical truths because God has a seity and is absolute, just as Poitras writes, I quote, some truths of mathematics, or perhaps all truths of mathematics, may be necessary in an absolute sense because they are implications 
of God's character. Mathematics appears to our world and works because it flows from the mind of God, so thus it is real, end of quote. Just one example would be the infinite aspect of numbers. There are numbers that are larger than any collection that actually exists in the physical world. Thus, the physical world cannot account for infinite numbers. Moreover, there are an infinite amount of numbers, an infinite amount of geometrical shapes in that one human mind or even all human minds can contain or comprehend them all. God's mind can because he is infinite and eternal. Thus, the only mind, thus only the mind of God can account for such infinite truths. God's thoughts are where mathematical truths reside. God's thoughts are those things that are true and it's true truth. Even before they became embedded in the cosmos, mathematical truths resided in the mind of God. Because God has a seity as a great I am, mathematical truths reside in God himself. William Lane Craig said this. He may have changed his view recently, but he said this. The theistic realist can argue that God has fashioned the world on the structure of mathematical objects. The realm of becoming is comprised primarily of physical objects, while the static realm of being is comprised of logical and mathematical objects. God looks to the realm of mathematical objects and models the world on it. The world has its mathematical structure because of God. An issue for the strict atheistic naturalist, how does an atheist justify affirming that two plus two is four tomorrow, even if it's true today? Or how does he know 2 plus 2 equals 4 will be true next month or next year or on Venus? David Hume rightly noted that without God, because something is true today, does not justify the same thing will be true tomorrow. In contrast, God sustains mathematical truth since they are immutable ideas in his mind. Thus, the Christian can justify the perpetual mathematical truths that we see scientists and mathematicians working out in our midst. Philosophers of mathematics are sharply divided as to whether mathematical entities like numbers and sets and functions and so on really exist or not. Realists, like myself, hold that such objects do exist as mind-independent, non-spatial, non-temporal, abstract entities that exist in the mind of God. Anti-realists are united in denying such objects actually exist. An important question for anti-realists, they have to contend with this, as Wigner famously called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Why is mathematical truth the language of nature? What accounts for this? Christians have the ontic resources in God to account for the usefulness of mathematics. But rigid atheistic naturalists believe all that exists is just matter in motion, nothing else. Now Craig's argument for God from the genuine applied usefulness of mathematics to the physical world, I'll sum it up in my own world, my own words. Craig's simple formulation is, is like this. If God does not exist, the effectiveness of mathematics applied to the physical world is just a happy coincidence. Two. The effectiveness of mathematics applied to the physical world is not just a happy coincidence. Therefore, God exists. Craig says this, I quote, In this argument, one isn't trying to explain things by mathematics and science. Rather, one is trying to explain why mathematics is scientifically useful in describing the way in which the world works. Without God, the unresolved point is, why does a physical world have this complex mathematical structure that it does have so that mathematical calculations are so usefully applied to it. Why is that the case? Is this just a happy coincidence? Nope, it's a product of God. Craig continues. Why not say the reason for the unnaturally neat connection between the two is down to evolution? The ones to see the link between the two are the ones most likely to survive. End of quote. This question is based on a confusion of epistemology and ontology, Craig later draws out. One is not trying to explain how or why we have mathematical knowledge, epistemology, epistemic issues. 
but why the physical world is describable by mathematics. When you see the word is many times, it's talking about those things that touch on ontology, ontic issues, what actually is. The question still remains, why is mathematics useful? Why is the mathematical usefulness in nature there? Why is it there to discern in the first place? Evolution cannot account for this ontic reality. But you know what? Not everyone agrees that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true. Some sects of Hinduism think that all plurality is an illusion. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is just an illusion. On the most ultimate level of being, 1 plus 1 equals 1. If you play on and put your ground upon strict Hindu thought. If one rejects Christian theism, ultimately one is bound to a radical diversity or sharp unbending unity. If everything is in the end composed of non-relating particulars, there's no place for laws and perpetual norms. This undercuts itself. One must use the laws of logic to assert that claim. In touching communication, this radical diversity cannot unify brute facts and words. You need the God of Scripture to do such. In contrast to Eastern thought, the idea that everything is one and all diversity is an illusion is not an option within the Christian worldview, but it is in certain forms of Hinduism and Buddhist thought. To toss away all the particulars is to toss away the particular theory itself, though. It saws off the plank it's resting on so that it cannot be the case because it refutes itself. If all things are just an illusion, the assertion that all things are just an illusion is also an illusion. So that assertion impales itself and cannot be true. This monism cannot be true for it defeats itself, it refutes itself, it stultifies itself. If one truly believed that all is one and diversity is just a mere illusion, why do Hindus and Buddhists look both ways before they cross the street? Why do they flee from a house on fire? Why do they swim away from sharks? If the monist gets hit by a bus or consumed by a fire or eaten, and all that is left of him is just a big stain somewhere, this helps him meet his goal of oneness with the world. Plus, he shouldn't fear pain, since pain is just an illusion. The car is an illusion. The fire is an illusion. The shark's an illusion. All is an illusion, they say. In monism, there are no particular things such as cars, fires, sharks, and pain. Obviously, this is self-defeating and illogical. One would not live long if one attempted to live out monism. Additionally, it's rationally self-demolishing. Now, what about Islam's Allah? Well, the Quran says in Surah 3 that Allah is the best of deceivers. In Surah 14, it says that Allah leads astray whoever he wills. It's important. The proper use of mathematics and of logic requires morality, the proper use. Disclaim Yahweh and his moral law, and there's no obligation to affirm that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and that A is A and not non-A at the same time in the same way. Remember, the Quran states that Allah deceives. Must I affirm mathematical logical truth? If so, I must provide objective, unchanging moral grounds for that obligation that the Quran lacks. Because that requires the unchanging God who does not deceive not all of, for two plus three, not to be four, anywhere at any time requires universal truth with presupposes an all-knowing God who supplies a moral law and demands truthfulness. Yahweh's law commands all men to tell the truth and forbids lying based on his truthful, non-deceptive nature, not so with Allah. This is one reason Islam's Allah is false and is a false god. Mathematical truths are immutable and universal, yet mathematics and all abstract objects are causally passive. And God has created the world on the edifice of mathematical abstract objects. God's thoughts are logical and mathematical, and he sustains and crafts the world on these non-physical objects. The cosmos exhibits mathematical structure formed and maintained by God. And that's why God must exist. This is Pastor Mike Robinson. Until next time, say may God richly bless you.